right, welcome to the Steve-O and Goody podcast. We just want to take an opportunity this real quick to welcome you. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the trials and tribulations of a couple of particularly good-looking hunters. (laughs) (laughs) Traipsing around the Australian bush. Too young, very good-looking, and tall. Yeah, tall. (laughs) And freakishly tall. (laughs) (laughs) Americans who are trapped in down and down. And uh, our experiences living over here and hunting here and elsewhere around the world. We're going to get on with that today, so stay tuned. It's the Steve Owen Goody Show, live from... Well, we're not really live. We're not even close to live. In fact, by the time you're hearing this, we may even be dead. <laughs> hey, thanks for tuning in to the Steve Owen Goody Podcast Show today. Today, well, we got a couple of people writing in saying, Hey, who the heck are you guys? Hey, we're going to tell you just a little bit about ourselves. Today. So, Goody, what is it that gets you out of bed in the morning? Um, fear of my wife killing me in my sleep. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. You mean like what motivates me out of happiness? Yeah, yeah, not yeah. Not fear and what dread. What motivates you to, to get out of that twin bed and put on those fantastic Ugg boots you got there? Yes. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm quite passionate about my work. I do management consulting to a range of businesses, right? So um, you uh, Yeah, one could argue that. I'm a lawyer by background. And I do an area that's kind of related to legal practice. Fairly controversial at times, so I'll keep my anonymity there. I've got a wife and a daughter that have grown accustomed to a lifestyle to which I have to support. <laughs> so, Which is so, why we have this podcast. Which is part of the reason why we have this podcast. So if anybody wants to send in donations, feel free. We'll, We're we'll here. Happily accept We're here. We're, We're here. here. So, uh, yeah, so that's it. I've been in Australia for 20 years. We live both in a particular Australian city that we're not naming. What about you? What gets you up in the morning? Usually that's my six-year-old jumping on my head saying, Daddy, I want yogurt and toast and drink, please. I have a genuine desire to help people. Okay. Nice. And that's kind of my big focus and has been my entire life. Okay. So. Which is why you're studying what you're studying. Why don't you tell everybody what you're yeah. studying at the moment? I might actually start a little before that. So worked full-time on an emergency medical crew, ALS ambulance for fire service and worked part-time for police department. So being a service person has always been okay. just part of my DNA. Mm-hmm. I want to help people. So what are you studying now that's going to help people? Education. And so, we went to this discussion before about studying yeah. archaeology. Let's, let's take it yeah. easy there, Indiana. Yeah, yeah. Just so settle I'm, down. I'm studying to be a, a school teacher. Okay. Lovely. Look at the ass. Yeah. Interesting. And what... Um, Paying it forward. You know. Paying it forward. Look at that. Yeah. And um, in addition to the significant remuneration... And large salary you'll get as a teacher. What, <laughs> what are you? What are you hoping to achieve being a teacher? Do you? Um, have you I, thought I wanna, about that? Or uh, yeah, I, I want to make some real difference in you know the lives of kids. But at the same time, I think my real focus is I want to get into policy okay. on the okay. high end, like okay. at least the state, possibly the national or international level. Okay. Um, but obviously, you've got to do the grunt work to get yeah. there and that's the uh, that's the idea that I'm going for and that's kind of my initial goal I want to do uh, more administration um, okay. policy writing I want to be that guy that when when I write a paper and somebody says well who are you and that's who I am okay that's right so you need to listen to what so I say because I know what I'm broader, talking about the influencing kind of the broader agenda rather yeah. than just teaching and, okay. because I think that there are some seriously screwed up things in the educational system yeah. pretty much worldwide yeah. uh, that could be fairly easily remedied if you remove the politics from it okay interesting um yeah okay. but that's that's what gets me out of bed in the morning um and probably the thing that gets me out of bed more than that though is anything to do with archery okay so you're passionate about the sport i'm passionate about bow hunting i'm passionate about archery i'm passionate about helping new shooters i'm passionate about teaching uh younger kids how to shoot okay. getting them out there and kind of progressing the sport and and passing it on to the next generation because I feel like if I have this great wealth of knowledge and mm-hmm. this great power I guess so to speak that I want to be able to you know use that wisely and pass it on to a next generation and okay. that's kind of obviously why I'm being a teacher as well okay so nice yeah. interesting all right so your chosen profession obviously is in line with your natural passion to to facilitate learning and develop people and help them progress in whatever journey they're on well is that safe to say my natural passion would be to be a professional hunter 
and not have to do anything else in my entire life. But even then, that's helping hunters and clients yeah, because agreed. Agreed. that's one of the things I noticed about really good professional hunters, the hunters that I've been clients of or worked for or dealt with or whatever. The thing that really separates the good from the bad is that ability to help hunters become better hunters or achieve a dream or progress a dream or whatever. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. But in, okay. in the short term, there, it requires money to make those things That's, happen. That's, yes. So, yeah. yes. And I have, I'm, I'm a family man, just like you are. Mm-hmm. Um, Except you like your family, I think. Is that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Usually. <laughs> my wife tells me we're very happily married, so I'm assuming I like my family as well. Yeah, so I have a wife and, and three young children. Mm-hmm. Kind of my passion to get out and teach them to hunt and teach them to shoot. And, okay. and I've been kind of expanding that into the broader community. I also own Caitlin Outdoors. Okay. Which is a... Um, Isn't that a porn distribution? <laughs> oh, no, that's the other business you own. Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know Chicks with stabilizers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the vibrating... Sta- I didn't know you need double D batteries for a stabilizer. I thought that was a bit... <laughs> it's it's, a, proto- it's ones, a prototype right? model. Yeah, that's it. That's, sorry, it's I It's got a little you. bunny on the top. <laughs> 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 sorry sorry very inappropriate this is a family show okay interesting so you're <laughs> oh we're better now oh we're just regaining our composure so good he's got coke zero coming out of his yeah, nose that's it in addition to your various businesses mm-hmm. so you're passionate about teaching and helping people family and man and... i'm a custom bow string maker as well and uh as we said in the last podcast which will be coming out this week yeah i also I'm a, a bow pro, and so I fix and set up and and do that thing. And I've been doing that for decades. Lovely. Okay. Yeah, because you you started when you were quite young, is that right? My dad owned a shop when I was little, and so I, I apprenticed in a shop. So I'm actually apprenticed as an Easton Aerosmith. Look at that. Nice. Yeah, with so my dad. that and your archaeology major can get you to be the head waiter at the afternoon and the dinner shift. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Maybe, if you're lucky, on Saturday brunch. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Very brutal. Very brutal commentary. I've, I've had a rough weekend. We're going to talk a little bit about that later on in the show. Oh, are we? <laughs> about that bloody carpet shopping that I had to do. Oh, I can't wait to hear about that. I've been waiting all weekend. <laughs> that. So, but we'll have to give him a little insight on that. Um, yeah, so my dad uh, owned the shop. I grew up apprenticing a shop. At about eight years old, seven years old, I started apprenticing as an Aerosmith. Okay. So we made everything <clears throat> that was that was pre carbon arrows. Okay. And so we were doing aluminums and. Um, Don't you mean aluminium? Aluminium. Oh, sorry, we're in Australia. Aluminiums. <laughs> and then um, we also did cedar shafts as well. Wow. So yeah, we for did, the old traditional guys. Yeah. So, yeah. so I do custom. Nice. Yeah, I do custom flesh. Do you do the wraps? No, I do crests custom. And I do custom stuff. crests. So like with oh, a paintbrush, wow. the whole. Get out. The whole shebang. Um, and that's what I started learning to do when I was really young. Okay. So we did the dipping and the cresting, oh. and uh, so that's where I started. And then I started obviously working with with the old man and learning the ins and outs of bow mechanicness. Nice, nice. nice. And, uh, yeah. and so in terms of um, hunting, just because this is a hunting show in theory, hunting podcast. Favorite type of hunting? Favorite type of hunting is definitely bow hunting. Okay. I do rifle hunt. Um, I'm not overly opposed to crossbow hunting, mm-hmm. though. I personally don't feel that that's archery. Okay. I think it's, it's Ooh, uh, very controversial. Yeah. That, Look I, at that. I'm not against it. I'm not against it. I just believe it's in its own class. Yeah. Yes. Because if you're going to say that that's archery, then you might as well say that's rifle hunting too. Because it's kind of right in the middle. I think it needs its own class. Mm. And I'm not talking about seasons or anything like that right now. I'm just saying. It's categories. I, it's, I think it's. Well, class. in Australia, most um, most states have reasonable prohibitions on the use of crossbows anyway. I, I, I don't know where the latest legislation is up to date, but most of them you can't do it anyway. I think Queensland's probably the notable exception. I think you can hunt. You can hunt with a crossbow in South Australia right now, but they're on... But it's got some it's weird... It's in cl- legislation right now okay. that they're trying to make it illegal to use a crossbow yeah. here. And, well, well they, and they're trying to make it so you have to have a, right, a gun license yeah. to have one. Well, they have in, in New South Wales. Which is another whole argument yeah. for the reason it should be classified yeah. differently. Well, the, if you if you make the argument that the lack of requirement to draw it and hold it, mm. as opposed to it being artificially drawn and held for you while you aim, but I get it. I think the I think where you align it more to archery is that you typically have to get closer distances, certainly than a rifle, certainly than a shotgun, um, and where you aim would be identical to what you do in archery. Right, so if you think about where you place the arrow or the bolt, it would be identical to an archery. Whereas, with 
a rifle. You can do heads. You can do different shoulders. You can, you know what I mean? Like you can do it in different spots. But I get what you're saying. I don't think it's the same as archery. I, right. I generally agree. I, I agree. I, I, but let's, like it's like we said, I'm I'm not against crossbows. Yeah. So please don't write in. Yeah. And say. Look at that! Was a crossbow. But I lost from... my legs in the yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, seriously, I got in this argument one time, Paige, with a guy, and this guy said, "Do you think that crossbows should be allowed in during archery seasons?" And I said, "No." However, that being said, I think it should have its own season. Yeah. This is in the U.S. In the U.S., yeah. 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 I think it should have its own season. I don't think it should be the same because it's not the same. Yeah. You don't hunt the same with yeah. it. Yeah. I guess from a tree standpoint of view, if you're only 20 meters away with a crossbow, it's just kind of one of those things. But I guess at the same time, I'm also a huge advocate for people with disabilities hunting. Well, and the other thing I see with, with crossbows on a, on a similar thing is new hunters. So I've had a number of, because I own a crossbow. I've actually had two since I've moved to Australia. Got the prohibited weapons permit in New South Wales. And I've owned it in another state that we may or may not live in. <laughs> um, and what I find is that that's a really good way to get non-hunters into bow hunting relatively easily. Yeah, yeah. In the sense that, you, you know, it really takes about an afternoon or maybe a day of shooting, sighting it in at very close to it. So say you're going to set up a blind and you want to knock over some goats. And you say, okay, you don't shoot past 20 meters. I think you can get, somebody with decent eye-hand coordination can get competent with a crossbow in a day right. at 20 meters. Not yeah. not further out, not at weird angles, nice broadside, whatever. And that's, that's an opportunity I've introduced a couple of people into hunting. Now, from there, then you can say, okay, if you want to stay in this sport, you want to be challenged and you want to really get serious about it, then jump over to the compound or, or traditional gear or whatever, and then continue your bow hunting. But at least the crossbow gives you an easy chance. So I've had people from interstate that say, oh, look, I'd love to go bow hunting with you. And it's not like I can hand them the bow and they can shoot it, right? And I don't want to bring a rifle. Some properties are kind of funny about rifle hunting. I think in addition to disabilities, it's brand new new hunters can get a chance to get it get the experience of what it would be like to get close to an animal, to know where to shoot it, to, you know what I mean, to see it kind of fall, to, you know, to get all of those elements. Plus, um, it's kind of cool if you point the crossbow up directly in the air, let it go, <laughs> and watch which direction they run it. <laughs> we advocate safety here on the Steve Owen Goody Hunting <laughs> Podcast. So, remember... Yeah. Safety first. Safety first. Go home to what you love. You know, even your was, family. When I was young, I, rem- <laughs> I remember when they started coming out with the laws that made it okay for people with disabilities yeah, to shoot crossbows or elderly or people. They had they had to get a permit to do it, mm. but then they could hunt during both. And I have zero issues with that. Mm. For me, it's more of a people coming in that don't have disabilities yeah. mm. and wanting to use crossbows during archery season. Mm. So. Yeah. You know, a 200-pound crossbow, they can shoot 100 yards, according to my brother anyway, who, who yeah. sh- has shot a few deer with his crossbow during archery season in Michigan. At 100 years? Are you 100 yards? 100 yards. Jeez. See, that to me seems ridiculous. 200-pound crossbow or something like that. And I'm just like, wow, that just seems crazy with the scope and the whole shebang. Yeah. And I guess, to me, that's not archery hunting. No, that's different. But if he was sitting in a stand and it was 25 meters away, and he just happened to use a crossbow, the only difference is... The drawing, you know, the, the the ability to shoot the bow and all that stuff would be... Agree. Yeah. So, so anyway, so getting back to your favorite types of hunting. So you like yeah. bow hunting? Mm-hmm. That's love, your favorite? I love bow hunting. Um, rifle I, hunting you'll do. Crossbow love, hunting you'll do. I like rifle hunting as well. Any um, wing shooting? Birds? Oh, yeah. I love wing shooting. Okay. I'm a big wing shooting. Over pointers or or with the labs and retrieving the duck and waterfowling and all that stuff? Um, depends on what I'm hunting, actually. Yeah. Okay. So I mean I've done I've done plenty of plenty of dog hunting, plenty of pointer hunting. Mm. Uh, I've done a lot of duck hunting, just calling them in in, in blinds. Okay. Um, the only thing I haven't there's a couple things I haven't done that I want to do that are on my bucket list, but I moved to Australia, so I can't do them. And that's the one is Sandhill Crane. Okay. I want to do that. I want to hunt Sandhill Crane, the ribeye of the sky. Ooh, nice, nice. Yeah, they're, they're red. California dog. condor. There's about three left. <laughs> you might as well get them in the way you can, buddy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I'm. Um, I have we a, support the protection of endangered species here at Steve Owen. Could he? <laughs> As we said before, I'm keen to try pig dogging, but it hasn't yeah. happened yet. Yeah. However, we do have a, a guy who is a pig dogger coming I'm on the show. I'm looking forward because I've in got the a, future. I've been fairly critical of pig doggers in the past within a within the appropriate context. So if you want to hear this crazy story, I have a super go at Goody. It's, make sure you stay tuned. For very that. excited. Very we'll, excited. We'll, we'll announce that when, when that comes out. There's one thing on my bucket list mm-hmm. that. I have not been able to get out of my head. Mm. And there's only one place in the world I think that you can do it, and mm. it's Saskatchewan, Canada. Okay. Ooh, okay. It's just been on... It's a, I saw a video when I was a kid, and the dad shot. My dad shot me. I play on the TV, because I always had wow. hunting videos playing on the shop TV. Jeez. And I just saw it one day, and I'm like, oh, I want to do that, but there's only that one place wow. in the whole world, I think. That you well, some bloke, didn't some guy who was a hunter out of Michigan... He was sponsored by was it Under Armour, and they got a somebody got a hold of him killing a bear with a spear, and he lost his sponsorship from Under Armour. I can't remember the guy's name, but I remember it was a big deal. And, and the problem, in the response everybody had, and the problem everybody had with him losing the sponsorship was well, it was legal. I'm assuming that's where where he did it. So very controversial sport. Very. Well, uh, I guess for me, I, I don't really care what anybody thinks about it because I'm not doing it for them. I'm not yeah. doing it for a sponsor. That's something that I've wanted to do for 20 plus years. Yeah, yeah, as long as it stays right. legal, I'll do it eventually. And that they're totally ethical too. I mean, they're yeah. crazy ethical kills. But granted, I did just watch somebody do it the other day on YouTube. Mm. And he was on the ground. Like he was like spot and stalking wow. with a spear. Okay. That idea I don't like. Why is that? As opposed to standing and dropping it? Yeah. Is that is that the... Yeah, yeah. So the way that I that I, that I'm keen to do it is from a tree stand. Mm-hmm. Um, you have a small little platform stand down below that your spear sets on. It's like a two foot long spear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The head's two yeah. foot long, and it's like six inches wide, double edged. Mm. You know, big heavy, so it, you big get weight. giant thing, and basically it's a twelve foot um, pole, and, and I think they're steel. Okay. They're heavy. Yeah. Right. I use that to um to fend off my wife. When she's when her species in, is in breeding season, yeah, it's yeah. tough, and usually you have to get above them, and it's tough because her wings keep her lifted, floating above. But it's a similar weapon to what I use to manage my wife. So go on. Anyway, so that's that's my big uh, hunting love. Okay, uh, nice. it's not really a love, I guess, but it's something I've always liked hunting black bears, and and I haven't got a chance to get any browns or cinnamons yet. Okay, but um, I, I'm really keen to. Polar bear? Would you hunt the? Uh... I would. Yeah, something about it. Honestly, I, I would. I, they're kind of cool. I just, it seems to me, when I see the videos of it... Would I take a bunch? No. Yeah, no, I'd do I, I one. Would, I would do one. Yeah. I, but it seems to me, there's something about polar bears... Because they're on the incline now. It, yeah, the, 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 the status of them. And again, like my wife, they're very powerful, very strong, mean set of jaws. And, and they're bigger than they look. Well, they're much bigger than they look. And like my wife, they eat seals. <laughs> Pull seals out of the water. Baby seals. Baby seals. And she likes to hear them scream. But anyway, enough about her. Um, so we. Um, I can't wait to show her this podcast. Uh, she, trust me, she already knows. <laughs> she smells fear in her prey. So, <laughs> so um, no, but it seems like the, the, the only thing that I found slightly ethically questionable about the polar bear hunting generally is because they are the alpha predator and because you're in pretty wide open country, it, it seems like, and again, I, I'm, I'm just going based on the videos I've seen and whatever of, of people hunting, is they actually seem like, they're quite inquisitive. Mm. So if they see you, because they're not used to things that can kill them or aren't skittish, say, like a deer. So if a deer sees you at 100 meters away, it runs. If I'm a bear at 100 meters, because I'm the top of the tree, I'm going to come and check it out. Now, I, I, I'm sure we'll get somebody who's hunted polar bear or an outfitter that'll tell me I'm all wrong on that one. That's the only question I have, is, is how likely are you to spook one? Mm. <laughs> like, and if... As opposed to if they come at you. Well, I don't think, I guess in my mind, I don't think that it would be, if you're going to spook them, I think it would be more, can you get that close to them without them knowing you're there? Because they're big and they can kill you quick. Oh, absolutely. And, and, that's and there's the nowhere other, to run. Yeah, and, and that's the other thing too. It's you can't like, just jump in a the, hole yeah. like the seals do and just that's it. go under right the water. <laughs> <laughs> They'll kick my wife out of the way and pull the little seal right out. No, but I think the, um, it just, and again, without only I want to be that jerk. With the polar bear standing in the corner, yeah, I want to be that guy. That'd be kind of cool, because it's a polar bear. It's, and you it's know a what? Polar bear. I'd put a coke in his hand. Yeah, just be yeah. a coke in his Smoke hand, hand. <laughs> with the with the Ray Bans. Yeah, yeah. 
Ray Bans and maybe a Tom Petty hat or maybe like a. Oh, How about a cigarette? Or we no, we're too family friendly for that. Yeah, we're too family friendly for that in my house anyway. But yeah, so I think it'd be great, and you can dress them up as Santa Claus in the nice. in the in the, in the winter time. Yeah, okay. but I think that'd be great. Okay, interesting. And I'm curious to see how they taste. Yeah, I, I, I'd imagine because I love black bear. Yeah, I've had black bear. I love black bear. It's so good. It's good. I like it, especially when uh, different times of the year that are eating different things. You can yeah, that's what you want. Right. Fall. I think the falls are better because okay. that's when they've been eating berries. All right. They've been eating berries and blackberries and sure. what, whatever's around, whatever their range yeah. is. They seem to taste better because they're still fattening up. You want? I, I like them better when they're fat. Yeah, the fat. Yeah, the fat helps. Spring with braids are still taste alright. They're lean though, but they're real lean. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's so that's a little bit about you then. So in, terms in of- Africa, I'm way keen to hunt Africa yeah. and just got a, a field staff sponsor, a field staff position with Red Sand Safaris in okay. South Africa. Nice. And we'll have. Uh, the uh, owner outfitter on on the on the podcast here pretty soon as well as a couple guys who just came back from hunting with him. Nice. So some some good stuff to come in the Steve and Goody show in 2018. <laughs> That's right. That's it. Here you go from South Africa. So Goody, how long have you been hunting? I've been hunting for about 20 years. So I didn't grow up hunting. My favorite type of hunting is bow hunting, obviously, given the fact that I do it every weekend in terms of going to the archery club. Am I particularly good? Shot? No. <laughs> no, I've got the eye-hand coordination of a duck on acid. But I've also uh, come to appreciate that the best part of bow hunting really isn't the shooting. For me, it's spotting and stalking. It's being able to kind of get into the environment. Um, so I love that. Um, I've been fortunate to have hunted on three continents now. Um, have probably taken a few hundred animals, probably a couple dozen species across all of those continents. Um, have... Um, have gotten into rifle hunting a little bit lately, probably in the last maybe two years. I've spent a bit more time with rifles. Um, and that's usually I'll go to a, a place, hunt with the bow for you know a day or two, and then maybe take a break from it for the afternoon and see if I can do some, some shooting. Um, again, my rifle shooting is comparable to um, my bow shooting in terms of um, on the range, it's bloody awful. <laughs> um, but what I've been able to do is um, discipline myself to not shoot beyond my range. So that the the offset for my bad bow shooting, right, yeah. is I typically don't shoot beyond 30, 35 meters in, in a bow hunting situation. And more commonly, much more commonly, I'll shoot at 20 meters or less. So if I'm at 25 and I think I've got another five, I'll take it. I don't care. I'd rather let the animal go. My ethic is a little different in terms of what I want to do professionally and personally. So... For me, um, it's not about helping others. It's not about, kind of, that's not my thing. It's actually really about helping myself. So you're selfish. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really about focusing on me and my needs. Um, and my career and my education has been centered around that. <laughs> so, while I'm significantly less noble than you are, um, I think I offset that hopefully with my hunting ethics, where I focus more on disciplining and kind of quarantining my worst behavior. I think you're noble. I think you're just noble in a different way, though. Okay. Because personally, because we've we've been friends for a long yeah, time now. For a while, yeah. Um, and for me, I think your nobility lies more in your loyalty to your friends. Yeah. Because you are you are a guy that if if somebody is your friend, you will bend over backwards. Uh, I that's probably a fair assessment. And I'll I'll share a little personal story if that's oh, okay with you. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So you know, um, so I got hurt pretty bad a few years ago. Yeah. And I was struggling, and and I ended up losing my job. Which oh, is, the yeah, yeah. The, this this is why I'm back at university. Yeah, and I was struggling for finances, and you said, "Hey, I got a little job that I know you can do." Yeah, that's right. Can that's you right. can you come around, and I'll pay you to do it? And that that made a huge difference. I mean, there were some bills that got paid. That's not wrong that we, with that. Right? We were struggling to pay. Yeah. So, yeah. I know you're. I know you're, I'm not the only guy that you've helped out like that uh, as well. Which we won't talk about that one. <laughs> but that's right. um, yeah, so you know, I know that you're genuine, and there's a reason everybody likes you. And well, so you're, you're, yeah, the noble fellow. I'm getting all misty-eyed here, but um, I'll stop it. Tell me more. But um, yeah, so from, in terms of, I guess, um, I think you're probably I'll right. expect my payment. Later. Yeah, that's it. Yes, I'll be sending the check over. Oh, did my mother call you? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so for me, I think it's been more about um, my, unfortunately, has been more about my professional life than my hunting life, which is kind of funny that we're doing a podcast because I've probably spent more time developing that. Do you think I've driven you to that? 
What's that, my professional life? No, to doing the hunting podcast. No, no. I, I said, hey, come on. You will come and do yeah, this hunting let's, podcast. Let's do a hunting podcast. You um, know what? We should tell everybody how this happened in the first place. Okay. Because who just gets up in the morning and goes, hey, today we are going to start a hunting podcast. And I'm sure that there are people that do that. But we yeah, are not those people. We, yeah, we didn't do that. We're not those people. So we'll just tell a little story so, every week. Probably every week. Just about, yeah, unless you're out of town mm-hmm. or I'm out of town, yeah. which is pretty rare for me. But <laughs> Not rare for me, sadly. Only when I'm hunting. Yeah. Um, pretty much. Um, so we pretty much shoot every week, and Goody and I are real good at spinning a yarn. Making shit up, even. <laughs> That's right. We like, we like to joke around a lot. Yes. And so a few people... Some of it borders on inappropriate. Most of it borders yeah, on inappropriate. In fact, most of it is way over the border of inappropriate. And well, certainly for me... Now that I think about it, I'm actually struggling to think of anything that's appropriate. <laughs> anyway, moving right along. Moving right along. So we, we do this thing every Saturday and occasionally something will say, hey, can I come shoot with you guys? Yeah, no worries. And so they'll come out and they'll shoot with us and they'll spend their entire day not saying anything. Yeah. And, actually and laughing. Not, and not shooting well. See, that's the other thing. Well. That's the other yeah. thing that we try to encourage is poor shooting. Yeah. Right? Because we don't want anybody <laughs> to actually achieve what they're trying to achieve on the... Because we know how hard it is to shoot a 20 when, you know, when you're laughing. When you're laughing. Or you got snot falling on your nose. When you're thinking, when you're visualizing in your mind what we've just talked about. And you think, why am I thinking this way? How did this get implanted in my brain? Oh, these two short knuckleheads that are carrying on. I'm catering to the lowest common denominator. Oh, mate, I'm not just catering to it. I'm I'm serving it a whole meal. (laughs) Anyway, so... A couple of people come with us, and then they all of a sudden, everybody wants to come with us, and more and more people are saying, hey, can I come with you guys? I hear you guys are hilarious. And we're like, are Why we? Not? Are we? Yeah. We're just chatting. We're just doing our thing. <coughs> and so somebody said a couple months ago, hey, you guys should start a podcast. Yeah. And we just said, huh. Sure. Yeah, right? I also happened to one of my other many hobbies, I guess. I, I have a recording studio. And then here we are. We have all the gear. And if you remember, the topic for that first podcast was going to be a very deep ethical question about how to finish off an animal from a kill <laughs> now we won't go into the into the depth of that topic now but you, you you do know that we have a, a red explicit lyrics on our itunes now do we really? yeah we've been tagged no oh, yeah. we've been tagged on everything wait they've tagged it yeah. not us yeah yeah they, they have to listen to them before they put them on that's what takes so long somebody has to listen to the podcast what? So if you look on iTunes, we have a little red square with a white E in it, and it means that we have it. Stop it! Yeah. We've been censored, man. We've been censored. Down with the system, man. We haven't been censored. We've been rated. Rated? We are rated now. We're like rated R, because we, we have we have some... Well, or M. Well, let's just be honest. You're filthy mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's my Tourette syndrome. <laughs> is, is that what it is? <laughs> so anyway, so here we are. Getting back to the yeah, yeah. topic again. So we've done a podcast. So you've been hunting for 20 years. 20 years. Focused mo- more on my professional life, really, than my hunting life. Although, I've invested a fair amount. I, I lived overseas for a while and hunted there, and, and lived in Africa and, and worked for a hunter. But in terms of my focus, for a range of reasons, not the least of which my wife and daughter have a lifestyle to which they have become accustomed, <laughs> to which I need to support. I, I've probably spent more time in my I know your wife has a... An expensive hobby of changing things in your house. Yes. Isn't that lovely? And particularly carpet yeah, recently. So, I want to hear about the okay. carpet. Just tell me about so, the carpet. We're going to take a break because I want to hear about the carpet. Yeah. My wife decides that, because um, we've got an investment property, and um, and we'd actually just had a tenant move out, and her sister and her husband had moved in for a couple months while they were buying a house. Unfortunately, she spent more time there than we normally do because we haven't really spent much time actually in the unit because it's we've never lived there. We just bought it for the investment. And my wife decided that we would get a better class of renter if we upgraded. A- after a number of um, discussions... Or a that, more expensive place to finish, fix when they move out. <laughs> yeah. um, after a number of discussions in which, um, which typically ended with me waking up three days later, not being able to eat solid foods, I, I conceded to redo the kitchen now we've got a good deal on a kitchen my brother-in-law is a builder so we can kind of manage it and this is in the rental rental, not the not the house house 
That's because you just did re- you just did the kitchen in there not long ago as well. Yeah, uh, about a year and a bit ago. Yeah. I like it. Actually. It's, it's a lovely kitchen. I really like the ceiling and the wall behind the uh, the sink. Yeah, yeah, the splashback, the subway. That's those are the ones I. Yeah, heard. that's the one you worked on. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, the subway tiles are particularly stunning, but expensive, by the way. Anyway. I bet they are. Don't get me started. So, in addition to the kitchen, so we get kitchen for the townhouse. We got to get that sorted. Then, she says, "You know, I don't think the carpet's up to scratch, and we've got to change the carpet in the lounge room." So, my wife then decides that we need new flooring for basically the whole unit, except for one area of the kitchen that's tiled. Which, again, after I awoke from our argument, um, emerged, I should say, um, wiping my bloody nose and. <laughs> and getting the ringing out of my ears uh, from the frying pan in the back of the head. Um, she said, well, look, we have to do it quickly because her sister and husband were moving out. We want to get a tenant in quickly and we've got to turn things around. My wife then decides to go do a charity walk on the weekend that we're supposed to pick this stuff up. So I said to her, well, look, maybe we can go after I, I go shooting at, our, at the club. To which she suggests in most direct and emphatic terms <laughs> that, um, that I wasn't going to be shooting. <laughs> So I, I said, well, what do you mean? I mean, I, I go shooting every Sunday afternoon. It's kind of my thing. She said, you have responsibilities that are more important than archery. Did you bring up the, did you bring up the charity war? I was going to, but it's kind of hard to compare our afternoon shoots to like supporting a bloody long walk. The, You're helping a friend with PTSD. I don't think she would buy that. For, it's for true that I have, it's clinically documented. I can sort you over that. I don't think she would care. I don't think she would care if you were missing a head. <laughs> you got to find this carpet. <laughs> so here's the more frightening thing, and I want all of our male listeners to contemplate this scenario. So you've had weeks and weeks of fighting with your wife about new carpet. And weeks and weeks. Weeks. Whew. Nasty, vicious fights. Things like, I'll kill you in your sleep if you don't agree with me kind of comments. <laughs> and to which she's quite capable. Um. <laughs> then, I'm her supporter. Yeah, yeah. I like Mrs. Goody. <laughs> yes. I don't know if I do, but other people do. Other people tell me she's lovely. My view is it's a deceptive facade. She's so, my buddy. <laughs> so that's she only because she hasn't. Yeah, that's only because she hasn't smelled out your weakness yet. When she will. <laughs> so anyway, she said she. Uh, so I want you to contemplate this to all our male listeners. You've been arguing with your missus for a number of weeks over the carpeting. You finally agreed to get the carpeting. She then says on the day. You're supposed to go to the carpet shop. I'm busy. You go. To which I then say, wait a minute. You want me to get the carpet, but we haven't agreed on the color. Then she says the words every man fears. No, no, no. You pick out the carpet color. I trust you. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Wait, Alarm bells are ringing, Willie. Wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Here. I know what happened in your own house. <laughs> when, when your house was getting redone okay and I know how adamant a very specific blue yes. needed to be the door needed to match, match the, the lights. lights yes and, and all that and I remember a color not being quite so right yeah yeah and I remember what happened the, the, the conversation <laughs> because Mrs. Goody told me about that he had to come back and repaint yeah. things and I was like oh and so now in my mind I'm like yeah Oh, so so uh, I you, have the fashion. You must have done okay because you're still alive. Yeah. Well, we, it hasn't been installed yet. <laughs> has she seen the color? No. Oh. Yeah. So we're. I'm still living on borrowed time. But on the bright side, at least she doesn't live in that house, so it's not as big. She'll remember it every day. <laughs> she'll take a photo from now. now. <laughs> she'll Babe, be like, we'll be not, we won't remember each hey, other. Goody. Yeah. Remember back 90 yeah. years ago she, when you were a butt. She will be 90 years old. We won't remember each other's names, but she'll remember that I dumped the carpet. I'm just telling you. Anyway, <laughs> so she then says to me, oh, no, I trust you, and you can pick the linoleum, for, or the vinyl for the floor. Again, um, I was struck with a sense of fear and desperation that I haven't experienced since I think I almost got hit by an 18-wheel truck when I was young. I, I just remember that sense of fear and dread, thinking, I'm never going to get out of this alive. I then proceed to the carpet shop, where the guy serving me is a 19-year-old kid. See, I was hoping for like a 50-year-old woman who's redone a bunch of houses, who knows all the different colors, who can tell me the difference between a lime green, antelope green, whatever that is, 
right? <laughs> <laughs> Who can? T- <laughs> right? So, like, what is it, 1974? Well, honestly, like, I don't even know. So he actually did an okay job, but he kind of looked at me weird when I said, "Well, I'm not really sure what my wife wants." And eventually, we got to the point in the conversation where I said to him, "I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I'm some kind of pussy because I'm afraid of my wife." And I said, "How old are you, kid?" He said, I'm 19. I said, first of all, I've got shoes older than you. Secondly, <laughs> you're going to be about, oh, 10 to 15 years from now. And there's going to come a point in your life where this, this day will pop up in your memory. And you remember that old American bloke who came into the shop <laughs> who just wanted to get out of there alive. And you'll say, I understand now. I completely understand where he was going. I mean, he laughed. I don't think he really believed me. But someday I want to revisit him. Maybe again, 15 years from now. Can I make a suggestion? Please do. Next time, the wife says, I trust you. And sends you and says, pick a color. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> I'm good at that. It doesn't. <laughs> no, you're not. Yeah, but then then you can blame it on me. No, well, I did, I did the next best thing. I lied to my wife and said that the kid was a woman. <laughs> and that she recommended the color. So I thought I should be okay. <laughs> right? and, but, now, and now she's going to hear this and she'll know. <laughs> She's not going to listen to this. <laughs> she doesn't care. She thinks this is silly shenanigans, and we shouldn't bother. Well, this it is stupid. Is. It kind of is. So, which it is, but she's not going to waste her time. She has small peasant children to beat. <laughs> so that's how she spends. <laughs> that's how she spends her time. So anyway, so we, I go down. I order it. Um, about three grand later, we're all carpeted up, and now as of today's, I've got to wait for the carpet guy to come in. And... That's a Cape York hunt. Don't get me started. And here's the funny thing. We did it to get a better class of kind of renter because we had a, a renter previously who was a single mother, actually. Kind of a weird story. She had a couple of kids under five. She was a single mom. And I got the sense looking at the kids that they weren't from the same dad. <laughs> now, I didn't have any genetic testing available, but I would suspect that she, um, she got help from the government and she probably wasn't too fussy as to who she spent her time with. And so we wanted somebody a little bit better because the we had renters before her that were much, much better. Like, Well, it sounds like you just need to do a better job of vetting. Well, the problem is that... Renters? When you, yeah, but we didn't get a lot. So we were a little desperate. And we think what had happened was... Because it was a bit run down. Like, to be fair to my wife, it was a bit run down, needed a bit of a freshen up. Now, I would have thought a coat of paint or some new curtains would have been fine, but you know, apparently we needed carpet. Yeah, the most expensive thing to do. Yeah, it? yeah. I said, why don't we put a jacuzzi in there while we're at it? And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so we um so I I went through that experience and my view is uh it's not fun when your wife leaves you high and dry. Well, because again, if she genuinely did trust me, I wouldn't worry, but she doesn't. I know she doesn't. She knows it, I know it. I know what's going to happen. She's going to see the carpet and say, "Why well, you pick this color?" And I'm going to say, "But you trusted me." And you left it up to me. And she'll say, "Um, I don't anymore." Yeah. And she's <laughs> yeah. going to say, y- "You know that's bullshit." <laughs> You know you can't use that excuse. We don't know what the charity was, but she was walking for charity. Yeah. And the, doing, bl- the bloody long walk. I'm happy to plug it. Doing good things. Yeah. You know. To offset sense. all the children that she's eaten. <laughs> I love you, Mrs. Goody. You've got good things going on there. Yes. Proud of you for doing such good charity work. Yeah. yeah, so her and my daughter are important parts of my life as well. Mrs. Goody has hunted. And she's actually got a, a really nice kudu. Um, Is that the one in the trophy room? Yeah, that's the full mount. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, it's lovely. It was a great shot. You know, it's funny. She's one of those people that um, has done really well in hunting. Good shot, good eye hand, and... Just not into it. Just not into it. Yeah. See, she just, just haven't caught the bug. Now, most people, like, they go on a hunt, you get them out in the bush, they love it. She just didn't. And it was kind of funny, because I suspected she would. I thought... Was that a spot and stalk? Yeah, it was all spot and stalk, yeah. That's oh, right, because didn't you say she got really close? Uh, from For a rifle distance, yeah. She got about 100, 100 meters? That's not bad. That's not bad. And it was kind of... For a first-time hunter, yeah. Yeah, and then she got a blez buck at um, 80 meters out in the open. Nice. So, yeah, and it was a really, really good stock. Like, that was really bloody impressive. I was really impressed with her in both hunts. But again, and she's taking goats, and she just doesn't care. Like, again, if I had if I had done that well my first time hunt, I'd be hooked. I already am hooked, right? I didn't do well on my first time hunting. And, and I don't get it. But the good news is she kind of understands the importance of hunting to me. So she kind of gets why I need to go. Right, it's not a big deal, um, but in terms of getting her out, cause my other strategy was to get her out so that we could go more often. 
right? Like my view is if, if she comes, then I can go hunting more. Yeah, yeah. And the truth is she's not the problem. It's my career that's really more my limitation. Well, isn't that the truth? Yeah. We've had that problem with the podcast. Yeah, like I can't, <laughs> like I just, yeah. So in terms of my priorities, if you ask me what gets me out of bed, what gets me out of bed really is at this point building my career, but trying to balance family and my passion for hunting. I, I'm very passionate about it. I think there's something magical about hunting that you just don't see in any other discipline, right? And in it, in it's, there's an element of competition. There's an element of beating your environment, having an adversary in the game. You know, all of that stuff, plus a set of rules. Have you ever dreamed of hunting Africa, but you thought it was just out beyond your reach? Red Sand Safaris is situated in the heart of the Bushveld in the Lampopo province of South Africa. With plentiful hunting opportunities in the African bush, along with its diverse bird life and natural beauty, Red Sands is a must for any adventurous hunter. Red Sands boasts a wide range of game, from the smallest and tiny of Steenbach to the mighty and dangerous Cape Buffalo. At Red Sands Safari, they not only cater for rifle shooters, but they also cater for the bow hunter. So no matter what kind of hunting you're into, they've got you covered. All you need is a spirit of adventure and good aim. Welcome to Red Sand Safaris, where professional hunter and outfitter Neil Becker will work with you on a personal level, one-on-one, -on -one, to make sure that you have the exact hunt that you are looking for. If you're keen on getting this Africa dream going, contact us directly at contact.rssafaris all one word at gmail.com and remember to leave us the country that you're living in so that we can get you out the correct brochure and price list is it time to make some dreams happen i think it is i'll be out there next year will you for you you've always said that it's all for you it's all about getting as close as you can yes yeah for me i mean i guess i like to get close but that's not really a thing for me what what, what is then what's the thrill of the hunt for you you know, it's it's a hard thing to describe, I think. Try. Live I'll, on the I'll, edge. I'll try. I'll try. Um, I think I like knowing, I like the I like the knowing that I've outwitted something. You know, like, kind of like you said, I, I do agree with that. Kind of feel like I've outwitted the, you know, my, my prey and I've gotten in close. So I guess I like the idea of getting in close and, and, and beating my prey and, you know, on their own terms. And I guess I like that about it. But I know for you, it's like, get as close as you can. And a lot of guys like the kill. Yep. The yeah. kill doesn't do much for me. I don't I don't get buck fever, really. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not saying I will never get buck fever. Because I know guys who don't have buck fever. And then there'll be that one animal yeah. that gives them a buck fever like crazy. And they can't stand up. Yeah. They're falling over. They're shaking yeah, so bad. And I'm sure that when I get to Africa, that will be yeah. that will probably be one of those when I see yeah. something that's just that big. Because I know the animals are spectacular, so much big. or even a polar bear, maybe <laughs> you know someday, <laughs> or spear a bear. That's it. You know? yeah. But um, yeah. So I mean, I think that's it. I know for me, like, like I can just give an example. Just the other weekend when I was hunting, um, oh. I shoot a goat, and then my heart was beating absolutely normally. Nothing had changed. They took like ten steps, and then they dropped. Mm -hmm. Now when they dropped. I started salivating. Nice. Because there's one in the freezer. Yeah. You're going to be delicious in a pot roast <laughs> yeah, yeah. in my slow cooker next Sunday. Yeah. You nice. Know? So I guess that's that's kind of it for me um, for that. But. See, because I think that the, the kill to me is essential, but it's not why I do it. Yeah, it, yeah, it's kind. Of, it's kind of a weird thing. There was a great. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, so what was it? There was a Spanish philosopher double-barreled name, uh, I can't remember his name, but he said, I, I don't hunt to have killed, I kill to have hunted. And it's the idea that, well, we don't have to kill something or it's not about killing something, that the killing is an essential part of it. So I've had people kind of speculate, like non-hunters particularly, and those who are probably a little more against it, but not full-blown antis, that have said to me, well, why can't you use a paintball gun? Or why can't you do some equivalent of a green hunt? And I think that's a legitimate question, right? Um, if it's not about the kill. But I think it would be a two-dimensional experience. I, I think 
the killing adds an element of dimension and depth and almost a spiritual kind of connection to the process that you kind of can't get with any kind of, I don't know, green hunt. Like, I know there's green hunts in Africa for rhino and that kind of stuff, but and I'm sure that's a great hunt, and, you know, I've never heard anyone complain about doing it. But I think there's um there's a there's just a flatness about it. It's not real. It's not genuine. It's kind of like, it's not the same as catch and release. Like I know why people fish, catch a fish and throw it back. I I get the thrill in that. You know, catch and release. Let me be quite honest. I've got some really good friends, huge catch and release advocates, but that does my head in. To me, that feels unethical. Okay. If you're gonna pull it out of the water, and there's now studies, whatever, that say that they feel pain. Which I don't... I don't believe, but go I don't know about that. But yeah. for me, if I'm going to pull it out of the water, I'm yeah. going to eat it. Yeah. Yeah. And not throw it back. Yeah. No, and again, without delving too down, far down, into, I think there's arguments for both sides. I think it's easier to do that with fishing than with hunting. I can have a good... I've done that. I've caught, caught barramundi, fought it for, you know, five minutes or whatever. It was big barramundi. How was that? Because I've never done barramundi, and I'm so keen... Uh, uh, it was fun. A, it was good. I hear it's amazing, but I don't know anything yeah. about it. It was fun. Um good fighting fish good fishing kind of that bit and i let it go a big fish i mean they can they can get quite large and quite heavy good fighters i let mine go even though i could have eaten it because i was i was fine with it but you can't really do it with hunting i, I can't imagine again somebody actually talked to me about this guy was actually reasonably well thought out he said what about paintball so bring a paintball gun and shoot the animal with a paintball in the heart like pick the target and that way you don't kill it and his argument is well look the worst it'll be in terms of injuries a welt because you think about, I mean, you've done paintballing, you get a bruise or whatever, and obviously you don't shoot it in the eye or anywhere sensitive. And um, a paintball would kill a rabbit. We're not talking about rabbits. We've had this discussion before. I'm saying if it will kill a rabbit. He's talking about like a deer or a bigger. If it rabbit. would kill an, if it would kill a rabbit, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's hitting hard enough that I don't think that it's ethical to do that. Because in my in my mind, that's catch and release. That's torturing it. Like, why on earth are you going to hurt it if you're not going to just kill it quickly? No, no, I, I, I get it. But but he his point was if there was a way. To do it without killing it, would you do it? That's my same argument for, uh, we talked about in the first podcast, about darting rhinos, the hunt for darting rhinos. And I said, I don't agree with that. I don't think, I don't like that. And the reason for that is you're constantly drugging the same animal. Well, yeah. That cannot be good for that animal. Yeah. That, and I guess to me, yeah. that feels worse yeah. than killing it. I guess the, the other way to think about it is then to, to make his argument or his discussion a little bit more easy to kind of eliminate the pain bit if you could shoot it with a laser that didn't hurt it so you had to hit it in the heart or something or outside of the body in the heart yeah and that was testing your adding all the elements of the hunt testing all your skill but not killing the animal to me it's still there's a spiritual element that's missing yeah it's it's not the same if you don't kill it so let me, I, I, that's just my view let me just ask you one quick question before we go on you're talking about like the spiritual element I don't know about you, but when I take an animal, I spend a little time with it. After you know, when it's laying there on the ground, I spend a little time with that animal. Mm. Yeah. What, what What do you do? I um I, because of my faith, I I thank God. I'm I'm quite adamant about that. I, I view that as a blessing from God. Um, I generally spend a bit of time in terms of um kind of respecting the animal in a way. It, it's an adversary. It's an opponent, and it lost. And especially if it was a quick clean kill which i you know i always strive for kind of like in a boxing match afterwards you yeah. don't hug the other guy even That's though you've been pounding like, each other in the face for yeah. Yeah. so what do you do when you say you spend time with it what do you do i'm i'm very similar to you i i thank god for it and i know we you had a go at me about this in the last podcast but i, I actually offer up tobacco okay. i don't know i carry i carry a small pouch of tobacco okay interesting hunt, put spirit to help it to go on and isn't that funny wow okay yeah Interesting. So I'm I'm the whitest Indian you'll ever see. <laughs> yeah, you're as Indian as I'm tall. Anyway, yeah, yeah. so let me ask you a couple of questions. So how long um, have you been hunting? I've been hunting for thirty ish years. Okay. Most of your life. Yeah. Significant been, part. Yeah. Of your life. Significant part of my life. I've been um, I've been I've been hunting in general probably thirty three ish years. Okay. I've been bow hunting for about thirty. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I've been rifle hunting for about twenty. 28. So that's a little different because most people start rifle hunting and then evolve into bow hunting. Yeah. But so most of the most of the hunters I know, particularly in Australia, you typically start off doing rifles, yeah. right? And then you say, "Oh, I'm gonna have a crack at a bow," and I'll go off you off you go. My dad started out um, hunting with a guy in Michigan 
named Dave Barabee, um, who used to hunt a lot with Fred Bear. Kind of a small kind of neighborhood kind of thing, I guess. Mm-hmm. In Michigan, it was kind of a, everybody was friends with everybody back then. He started out bow hunting when he was about 19. He'd rifle hunted before that, but he didn't start bow hunting until he was about 19 when Dave took him out. He taught him how to, get, he got a, basically my dad went out and got the itch. And uh, he'd rifle hunted before, but, mm. you know, bow hunting was where it was at for him. Okay. He just kind of got the itch, and he was way into it. And so he was doing that before I was born. Mm. And the other thing that was pretty interesting was he was a competitive archer as well. Okay. He got so he into, was into the Yeah, he got into, into comp- Yeah, he got into competition archery, and he was doing, um, I remember when I was young, he took, I remember if he took state or second place at state and in men's division. Which was pretty big deal. Yeah, that's, you know, that's back then. Bloody impressive. Well, it's a pretty big deal now. Yeah, but still. But um, yeah. So he was a competition shooter. Uh, got me into shooting competition when I was little. So I started out shooting. I mean, I'd shot twenty twos. I think I got shot my twenty first twenty two with the old man when I was probably two or three years old. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, that's it. But um, yeah. So he got me shooting archery real young. I won my first uh, uh, competition for Christian Bow Hunters of America mm-hmm. when I was five. Okay. And so I won. Won that for the Cub Division. Oh, nice. So, yeah. So, I think I was four, five, and six when I won those. But getting back to the, the, the competitive archery scene, yeah. one of the things that I think is a bit different between the U.S. And, and Australia is there's a lot more bow hunters that go into the competition scene, mm-hmm. right, than here. So, if I, if I go to a, a target club, archery club, you know, the straight feeder, shoot at 40, 30, 50, whatever... Um, in this the big target, the big Olympic targets and all that stuff. Almost none of them are hunters. Which is kind of interesting. And the reason that that's so interesting is I actually, because I know, because I'm friends with the largest suppliers in the country, mm-hmm. and I am a supplier, yeah. um, I know what the demographics are. Mm. And 90% of bows sold in Australia are hunting bows. Mm. They're not tournament bows. Isn't that interesting? And but, but if you go to any of these, any of the target clubs, you'll be under the impression that Target archery is the only thing that's big in this country, and bow hunting's not. Well, I don't know that it's not big. I just think it's a, it's very bifurcated. You, you've yeah. got target people, and you've got bow hunters. Mm-hmm. But I mean, some bow hunters compete particularly in three D and field. That are like ninety percent of people buying hunting bows, and the other ten percent buying target bows. Mm-hmm. Right. A lot of the guys that have target bows also have hunting bows. But again, I don't see that. My experience right. has been again. If I think about my just experience going to different clubs, so I walk, I rock up to our club, which is a field club, and I'd probably say fifty fifty hunt, yeah, yeah. maybe a little more. But let's call it fifty fifty. But probably ninety percent want to. They don't have a place to go. No, no. And that's yeah. yeah. I, well, no, but you know, I, I challenge it. I actually disagree with that. I think it's probably sixty forty of that scenario. Yeah, Are yeah, they yeah. a good forty percent of of the field clubs? They don't want to hunt. They want to compete in field archery. They like field archery compared to hunting, right? Because I personally only know maybe maybe 10 people at our club that have never hunted and have no desire. Yeah, and I, I, I probably know more than that. A- anyway, it, but then if you go to the other side, if you go to a target club, and I've been to a number in, that, in the city where we live, mm-hmm. <laughs> I've been to a number in other cities, and I would, I would say out of that population... 5% have an interest in hunting. Yeah. The rest are pure target. And in some cases, I found in some cases, there's an antipathy toward hunting in the archery world, mm-hmm. in, the ta- in the target archery world, that there's an animosity toward it. And I couldn't really figure out why. I don't know if it's a, oh, I just look down on them because they're a different discipline or because I actually don't like the fact Not that they all hunt. Of our... um, so again, that's my experience with... Um, the target scene here was I don't get that from the US. I mean, the target clubs that I've been to, I think, yes, there's clearly a target scene. Yeah, yeah. But if you look like, if I look at the, um, but most the of these US, tar- the most US of those Olympic target team. guys are hunters. Well, that's what I'm saying. If I look at the US Olympic team, for example, and then you kind of read a little bit about them, invariably they hunt. Whereas I would argue most of the target people in Australia that I know or know of or have some, you know, some familiarity with, they either against hunting. In some cases, staunchly or not interested. Because I know the target guys. I know quite a few target guys in the U.S. Mm-hmm. I know quite a few high-end target guys in the U.S. Like guys that who are top of their game, and people know who they are. Yeah. Like I'm first first name base with these guys, and and they're all hunters. Yeah. 
Homer. And I'm sure that there's some, there's got to be a couple of them that aren't, but um, pretty much all of them, like when you think like uh, D. Wild, um, Logan, and Rio Wild, the whole Wild family basically, um, you look at like Levi Morgan, and we could just go on naming these guys yeah. all day long. And almost all of these guys started out hunting. I know a couple of them started out shooting target, but only because they were too young to hunt. So that's, so that's kind of how long you've been hunting and that's who taught you to hunt was the old man yeah, in the terms old man. of I guess the old man taught me how to hunt yeah. Yeah. which I think is probably not uncommon right not in the states I don't think no. so No, it's probably common here as well those who hunt yeah. it's typically dad that took you out or yeah. usually it's some relative owns a farm that's kind of what I find that I, you know, Uncle Fred had a farm out in Whoop Whoop, and we went out there and shot kangaroos. That's typically the first rabbits and kangaroos and all that stuff, and then eventually they evolved into it. So tell us about your first hunt then. So proper, your proper first hunt. So the old man's kind of helped you shoot. You got into shooting. You were interested. Yeah. How old were you? Um, started small game and really young, but I'll just... No, 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 we're not Let doing that. Let me finish my sentence. No, you're not doing the... So I, I started... shot a chipmunk out in the window. <laughs> yeah, how about a proper hunt? <laughs> There was a sparrow that was sitting on my mama's planter. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, I started out small game hunting, but I'll move on. Yes. Moving right along. Let me finish a sentence and you'd have heard it. (laughs) We'll move on. I stepped on an ant on the way to the toilet. (laughs) We're going to move up to my first white-tailed deer. Okay. You. Not my first hunt, but we'll call that my first. That's called the first hunt, man. My Nobody's going to audit us. We'll call it my just first tell us the hunt. first time. We're going to call that my first deer hunt. Call it whatever you want. Let's just move on. Right. I didn't want to die here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my first hunt, um, 12 years old, was the uh, legal hunting age in Michigan. And uh, so I'd gone out, spent quite a bit of time out with my dad. I sat in the tree stand tons of times. Um, but the first time with a bow in my hand with a broadhead ready to go was out with the old man we were out on this property and um, they put me up in the condo Ooh. and they called it the condo it was a tree stand that was basically a platform it was built between four trees oh nice it was huge it had a toilet kitchen nope, but it actually had a <laughs> recliner up there nice a little cable TV I didn't sit in the recliner but there was a recliner up there somebody just had it up there I don't know what the deal was with that but they called it the condo, and we were up there. And my very first day hunting, I'm up there, and I've got these four does that come in. I got one doe that's literally dancing around mm. right under my feet. Nice. Could have shot it six ways from Sunday, no issues. Mm. The other ones that kind of dancing around, the farthest one out was at about 25 to 30 yards, kind of standing behind a tree. And she, it was four does, and she was the big doe. And mm. she was out. So that's about 21 meters for our Australian friends. Yeah, yeah. And so I was like, I want that one. Okay. I could have shot the ones underneath me all day long. But you wanted you a know, challenge. But I wanted that one. I wanted the big one because mm-hmm. I'm like, that's more meat in my freezer. Mm-hmm. And that was the idea. And so I let the other ones run around, and mm-hmm. that one never stepped out. And something off in the distance, I think one of the other guys we were hunting with in a different part of the woods, somehow spooked him, and they took off running, so yeah. I didn't get a shot. So I come home from that hunt, and I'm talking to my dad. My dad's paramedic at the time, so uh, we were, we stopped at the station, and this guy was talking about it and with my old man, and they said, well, how was your first day hunting? And I said, well, yeah, it was all right. Did you see anything? I said, yeah, I saw four. He goes, well, why didn't you shoot it? And I said, because the big one didn't step up behind the tree. And he goes, so were you shaking? No. Was your heart just racing? No. Well, Not at all. Wow. And so... So you're fairly confident. I was. Well, I've been shooting for years. Yeah, so you weren't worried about it. Yeah. And I'd been up in the tree. I'd watched my dad shoot lots of deer, and it, was, it wasn't it was a thing, I guess. Mm-hmm. We're sitting there talking to uh, his friend. His friend gave me the, the nickname Iceman because I must have ice running through the old veins just like my old man. Nice. And that And, that, and it stuck. So okay. let me, you know, there's a select group of people in Michigan who've been calling me Iceman for years. Okay. Because I just don't have that affinity to shaking and okay. getting crazy about it. Next day, we go out, and Dad had to work in the morning. Obviously, wasn't old enough to drive, so I had to wait. Dad to come home. Yeah. We went out hunting for the evening. So we went out, got up in the tree stand, and, and before we got out there, my dad says, I know that you're keen to shoot the big ones, but if it's brown, it's down, it flies, it dies. And so he said... But how? Do, what, what does the flies, it dies mean? Because it's, it's just kind of a saying that has always been... But is that for, that's not for deer, it's for ducks. Or it's for anything. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
It's brown, it's down, if it's fly, peril, it's, it's in peril. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so you know if it's, it's down. It's the argument it's, it's, it's the it's the argument. <laughs> it's the argument of the meat hunter over the trophy hunter. You know? It's brown, it's down, it flies, it dies. If it's brown, I flush it down. Go on. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Anyway, so I'm sitting up there on the tree stand and I hear something coming through and I see this doe come through. Mm. And it's one of the does I saw the night before. It's not the big one. It's one of the probably the second largest one. And I said, Well, it's brown, it's down. Damn. Brown is down. And brown it went down. So it was out there about uh, 16 yards. Okay. I believe. That's about what? Thir- uh, let's call it 14 meters. I think that works out. Pretty small anyway. Pretty Short close. distance. Yeah. yeah, it's really close. But, you know, I was a young kid. I had a 35 pound compound. Right. That's it. Thwacka. Yeah. So she came in, drew black, the old pin, had the old cobra dot pins. You remember them? Yes. With the, the painted tips. Stop it, man. Yeah. Oh, man, I remember and, those. Yeah. Jeez. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I pulled back and looked through the old peep site and just put it on the spot and just released, followed through, and stuck in probably about four inches. And she took off with the arrow banging around inside her. Four or five inches somewhere in there. And she didn't go far? Uh, white-tailed deer tend to do a half circle. Mm. And probably less than 100 yards from yeah, where I was. That's lovely. That's so I shot it. Psh, psh, psh. And it's, the, you know, you know, does make that does like, psh, 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 as they're running and, and they're shot and they're dying. And uh, so then I had, I hear this crunch, crunch, crunch. This like startled crunch, crunch, crunch after all this noise mm. and movement, right? And this buck of course. comes of out. Of course, yeah, yeah. This buck comes out and he is 18 yards from my stand. Wow. And I only had one tag. Wow. And it Let was, me guess. Was 85 point. It wasn't an 85 pointer, <laughs> yeah. but it was yeah. a nice eight point. See, that's it. Nice four by four, yeah. depending on where you live. Nice. So, nice eight point, and it was like, it wasn't like a, a mammoth. Had a birthmark it, right over its <laughs> Yeah, know, yeah. Like, yeah. It was just at the right angle, looking at you. Exactly. Yeah, of course. Pretty much. Not and he was probably, probably the, 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 up to that date, the biggest buck I had ever seen. Of course. In the wild. That wasn't on TV. Could I shoot it? No. no what the worst your thing man? is it was, was your man with your standard, forward. or were you by yourself? I was by myself. Ah, okay, so that's so why. That's why I'm calling this my first one because this is my first time in the stand. Yourself. Like the old man was in a tree stand not too far away. So, so let me ask you. So, so hold on, shifting gears. So we. So this buck comes out, and obviously you couldn't shoot it. Right, and he was on a path to come to me anyway. If I'd have waited, he'd have walked under me. Jeez. And okay. so that was. It was hard. It was hard. So, so how does so so think about your first time. Right, and, and you remember it. I think we all remember our first hunt. Right, I, I certainly do. I was older, but I remember it. Yeah. Two questions for you. One, what's changed when you kill an animal now as the result of a hunt? And what stayed the same? What's been a constant thread and what's been an evolution of how you feel or how you process something as a result? Well, for a start, I don't drink a cup of the blood of anything I kill now. No, no, not, not, not of the traditional stuff. I'm talking about yeah. the how you feel. Like, what is it about that experience because obviously it's your first time. So you didn't really, not first, but you know what I mean. That It's your first proper, just you, just the animal. You've won. Quick, clean, kill, it's down. So wow. then compare it to one as an adult or after years of hunting. Confidence. Do you feel confident after you've killed the animal? I'm talking no. about after you kill. What's, uh, this is what I'm trying to. I thought you were asking what was the difference between then and now. Whereas Sorry. Yeah, then, that's a good, yeah. then it was more. Like I had to think out every process in my mind as it was going. I had to really okay. think about, okay, I need to think about my breathing. I need to think about my stance. I need to think about my anchoring point. I need to think about my form. Mm-hmm. I need to think about my release and my follow through. I want to make. I need to think about, okay, this is how far, mm-hmm. because that was kind of pre range finder days. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. My old man taught me if you're hunting from a stand, you pace off trees so you yeah. know what things are. Yeah. So I had no idea, but you you still think about it. Yep. Okay. So I know they're about this much, and so where now, a lot of that's autopilot. Mm. I just know it okay. um, from decades of doing it. Okay. So, that, so yeah. confidence in terms of the hunt itself, but now after the animal's dead, or, or or after the animal's been hit, what what's different and what's the same, and, and how you feel, how you think. Um, one thing that stayed the same is the smell, because mm-hmm. I just. I, I don't like the smell of, okay. of gutting animals. And okay. It's not, I mean, I'll do it. It's yeah. not a thing, but it's, it's never something I've gotten used to. And, and I used to work on an ALS ambulance, so I, I know what it's like to smell horrible things yeah. in a 
confined space. And it's just something I never got used to. Okay. Um, Ginston, no, but I never got used to it. But um, I think... What's changed? What's changed? Um, well, particularly here in Australia, it's more about how am I going to get it out? Mm. Mm. Because, you know, back home, you're usually not that far from your truck. You don't have to drag it that far. Yeah. You know? Because the land plots are much smaller in, in particularly yeah. Michigan. Yeah, yeah. So, you I mean, you might Trucks be on... Near a gate, even if you're a on gate. Even if you're on state land, you're, you're still going to be fairly close to a trail that you can drive down. Yeah. So you don't have to drag it like two or three miles okay. out of a mountaintop. Okay. Which is what it's more like in the west, western states mm. um, of, a, of the United States. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I think more is how am I going to get it down. In particular here, like on the last hunt, I shot six goats mm. in 45 minutes in the same area. Mm. I'm like, okay, i got to get all of these down. <laughs> yeah. So I guess that that's a big thing. Okay. But um, as far as like the spirituality side of it and stuff like yeah, that, is that, is that what you're yeah, asking? Yeah. Just kind of because if you think about it, you killed an animal. I think I appreciate it more now. See, and that's yeah, that's what um, I wanted to hear. That, that's I good did. To hear. I did appreciate it then, but I think um, from the first hunt till like now, my first hunt, I was more there was too many other things happening around mm. to to kind of feel that so. You know, dad was, you know, because I don't know how, I don't know how you, you've never, you haven't done a whole lot of tree stand hunting. No, no. a little so, bit, not, yeah. I yeah, don't so when you've like got, it. say, you know, three or four guys hunting on the same couple hundred acres, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're usually within earshot. And so what we do is when you shoot, you start whistling. Yeah, so some everybody knows that. Yeah, well, you just do a whistle, you know, like a some kind of a bird whistle or whatever, because it doesn't spook out all the animals, but it um, alerts the other guys that hey I've shot something mm, mm. and so what we would do is we would wait 10 minutes then whistle and that way you know if there was something else coming in you got that has, that animal has time to lay down and, 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 and die and not get spooked and so nobody's getting out of tree stands pushing it on that first one you know I got dad coming I got Mm. I got his other buddy coming over. Because it's your first time. And they're time like, oh, did you shoot one? Yeah. And everybody's excited. Everybody's yeah. excited. So you didn't have a chance to really absorb it. And you wouldn't have. No. And I don't know at 12 if anybody would have been mature enough emotionally to really grasp it. I, I think we all do to a certain extent. But I think. I cried. But that's different than. Yeah. I think now you can appreciate it more as an adult. Well, we all do. I'd like yeah. to think we've all emotionally matured from the time we were 12 or 13. I know the anxiety mm. was a lot heavier. Mm. Okay. And not not like the race and like oh I killed something, but the anxiety of, you know, wanting to know that you, you clean yeah. killed it and yeah. wanting to know it was down and because particularly in in Michigan the area that we hunted anyway, is very kind of thick deciduous trees. Yeah, so it would have been tough to. You, you can't to. see it from where you are. Yeah. So you're like, is it down? Did it keep going? I have no idea. Yeah. And at that time I hadn't I hadn't learned to track yet, mm. so it's not like I'd have found it on my own anyway. Yeah. Let the old man help you. Yeah, yeah. So I had to. So that was that was that was my first tracking, learning to track. Yeah. You know, yeah. I learned to keep keep a. You know, my dad always said keep keep a roll of toilet paper in your pocket. Yeah. Because it's the turning of the colors time of the year, and so you got all these oak trees that are yellow with red splotches on them. Yeah, that's everything. Yeah. yeah, and so you just take a little bit of that white toilet paper and you touch it to see if it turns red mm. or doesn't. Mm. So you know if it is or isn't. Um, so yes, yeah, so that was my first experience learning how to track. So there was a lot. Of, I think there was just a lot more things I had to learn mm. at the same time. So it was like, hey, you're doing a great job. I got people grabbing a hold of me and shaking me and walking around and like, hey, buddy, high fives and blah 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 and mm. hey, this time we got to track it. So here's how we do this and here's how we do this. And the entire thing was a learning experience. So then okay. I got to the animal and, and I'd kind of helped dad gut gut animal and stuff before, but this time he's like, it's it's your own. Yeah, see you're doing this yourself. Yeah. All you, buddy. Yeah. All you. And oh, by the way, here's my, by the way, he here's my stainless steel yeah. Coleman cup. You're gonna drink a cup of blood. Oh, nice. No, not an entire cup. But it was about an inch yeah. in the bottom of the cup. He's like, you got You got You got to do it. It's your first kill. Yeah. You got to do it. That's funny. And just like dad, Dr- rabbits and squirrels don't count. Yeah. You know, just like you say. <laughs> I, I don't want to talk about. The old man is I'm getting fired up. Just getting fired up about these yeah. rabbits. Well, yeah. you know that's why our that's why our our podcast. Emblem is, is a rabbit. <laughs> it's a funny rabbit. Because I right. did that just to piss you off. Yeah, I, and you've done a good job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. But now I think it's it's a, it's a bit different because now I'll spend more time with the animal. Um, I think on this most recent hunt, I didn't spend as much time as I would have liked. 
and I think it was dark and we had to get everything pulled in and we had to get everything back down to camp and we were just in a bit of a rush mm. and I kind of felt bad about that. Whereas yeah. mostly, yeah. I'm the guy, I'll sit there for 20 minutes next to that animal if I'm hunting alone specifically. Yeah. Yeah. I'll spend 20 minutes to half an hour just kind of sitting there next to it, kind of petting it. Yeah. You know, and, you know, maybe a tear in my Fingering a little bit, maybe stroking it. (laughs) (laughs) You're nasty. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, Yeah, just find a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And and I don't even mean, like, pictures or, you know, posing it. I'll just sit next to it and have a moment, you know, and be, hey. And that's important. I think there's an element of closure. Like, there's an element of, I kind of have to give the animal its due. And I, I, you know, like we, we both agree that we both thank God. And I, you know, I said I offer up tobacco and, and, um, but for me, like, I thank the animal. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm petting him. I, I have a little conversation with him and, yeah. it's, and it made me, it probably makes me sound a little bit crazy, but yeah. you know, I'll sit there and I'll just kind of stroke its head and his neck and just be like, you know, just, you know, Hey, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for, for giving myself and my family substance. Yeah. Thank you for being a worthy opponent. Yeah. Thank you for, you know, uh, yeah, that's important. for being. Yeah. yeah. And I think because I hunt less for meat, I don't give thanks for the sustenance, but I give thanks for the challenge. So when I get a, you know, a misty eye or a little bit tear in my eye, it's not, it's not because I'm sad that the animal's dead. It's that I'm, a, I'm appreciative. I'm happy. Yeah. I, I think there's thankful a, or that sense it, of gratitude. There's at least a lot of emotion, yeah. I think, there. Yeah. And I think that non-hunters don't get that. Certainly anti-hunters don't. Particularly keyboard warriors. They don't get that we have that kind of a connection. Yeah. They yeah. don't understand it. They just think that we're bloodthirsty cruel. idiots that kill, yeah. kill things. Yeah. They don't. Yeah, they don't get it. They don't and that was it. the thing I was talking about before. Is that, that I think it was or something. Garcia y Ortega was the was the name of the f- Spanish philosopher that talked about hunting. But he said, I, I, "I kill to have hunted, not I don't hunt to have killed," and or other way around. But you get the sentiment is that the killing bit is part of it but that's not why you do it and i think i think to what you're talking about it's the same thing there is an element of respect you give to an animal that that you hunted whereas if you if it was about killing right if hunters were just about killing you know what we do go to the local farmer pay him for a, a cow and shoot it, and shoot it. And I've said that. I've, I've, I've used that exact analogy with a, non of, a lot of non-hunters that don't get it. And you'd still be more ethical than somebody that buys it from the store. Oh, yeah. Park that. Like, yeah, that let's way. not go down that road. But, yeah. yeah. But, but in terms of the, the bloodthirst bit. At you know where it comes from. Yeah. And... Well, but, but again, on the bloodthirst bit, if that's all it was, man, it's a lot easier. I can get it done in an hour. Go down to, you know, go down to Hondorf. There's a ton of little, small little cattle farms. Say, so, hey, man, I'll pay you a couple hundred bucks and I'll kill the kill the thing from the side of the the, feet, the paddock so for me i i think they they've got to understand that and they don't i also understand if you don't hunt it's hard to comprehend that because for me i the emotional angle for me is that particularly with deer not so much with goat and pig but it's a beautiful animal there's an elegance about that animal it is designed um either by god if you're a person of faith or if you're an atheist by nature right it's designed one way or the other by the world around it to be alert and to be aware and to stay alive and there's something beautiful about that animal in doing that and if you beat it in its own environment there is something spectacular about that but there's also no denying that it's a beautiful animal you, you get a big a, a, a rusa deer is the one that kind of sticks in my mind just magnificent animal a red deer i mean there's nothing more spectacular than a red deer or an elk same yeah, yeah. difference really and just a majestic they're they're, they're just majestic, majestic animals yeah. and and to kill one, there is an element of sadness. Not because you killed it, but because there was something that was defeated in its know, own I, environment. I certainly feel sad for my legs and my back. <laughs> yes, because because you know it's coming. Because yeah. I know that that's really not the end; that's the beginning. Yeah. Well, for me, I get hired help to take that stuff out. So, <laughs> so, so, and it's always a pain in the ass when you've got to untether its neck from the post, and I just find that particularly troubling. Yeah, yeah. So I even I don't even let them. I'm at that point where I just let the help. <laughs> Hey, boys and girls, that's all the time we got for today, but we love having you listen to us. We love talking to you. So stay tuned for our next episode, and God bless.